you're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, June 16th. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. The show airs live Tuesdays at noon and repeats at 5 p.m. and also on Sundays. And you can listen online anytime at kdrt.org. My guests today are Dr. Marianne Limbos with Yolo County Public Health and Dr. Andy Jones of UC Davis and KDVS and Pub Quiz fame. And we'll get to our first interview in just a few minutes. We'll be speaking with Dr. Limbos about what reopening looks like here in Yolo County and what risks it brings. And folks, just because something is permissible doesn't necessarily mean it's advisable. Business Insider recently published a list of the relative risk of different activities that are now opening up or available. The article was based on conversations with Dr. Susan Hassig, uh, who is an epidemiologist at Tulane University. Things considered high risk, gathering of family and friends, bars, in-person religious services, and movie theaters. These activities mix people from different paths and places, thus upping the risk of transmission, especially where people are not compliant with mask wearing and social distancing measures. So if you're trying to stay safe, these are really not recommended. On the medium to high risk list, gyms. Mask wearing and thorough cleaning of all equipment is necessary, but must be constant and consistent. Medium risk, indoor seatings at restaurants, uh, visiting hair and nail salons, one-to-one dates with people outside your daily circle. Low to medium risk, beaches and other outdoor pursuits and outdoor dining so long, again, as mask wearing and distancing is in effect. And on the low risk, shopping and touching mail or groceries. And Dr. Hasek said she does not wipe down her groceries or let her mail sit for days. She doesn't feel it's necessary. In local news, Courtyard Healthcare Center on East 8th Street in Davis has reported its first case of COVID-19. The Davis Enterprise reported yesterday that Courtyard, which provides skilled nursing and rehabilitation services, said this is the only confirmed case at the center since the beginning of the pandemic. It is one of five long-term senior care facilities in the county to have a resident or staff member test positive for COVID-19 though only the Stolwood Convalescent Hospital in Woodland experienced an outbreak, and and that was one that ultimately took 17 lives. So all skilled nursing facilities in Yolo County are now required to implement and submit to health officials a mitigation plan that includes baseline testing of all staff and residents by June 30th, uh, thereafter followed by monthly testing of all residents and staff. Uh, Let me just give a shout out to the Enterprise and especially reporters Ann Turnus Bellamy and Caleb Hampton for their continued excellent reporting on the local impacts of COVID-19. All right, the fine folks who bring us free yoga in the park are offering free online yoga classes during this time of COVID, including yoga in Espanol, yin yoga, myofascial release, and vinyasa flow. Times and offerings vary throughout the week, but the classes are free because the instructors and coordinators are volunteering their time. So if you need to take care of your body and your mind, you can learn more at yogamovesus.org. And finally, the downtown Davis Downtown Business Association is sponsoring the Davis Downtown Communal Art Project which calls for artists of all ages to participate in a community-wide art project focused on how we've all been coping with shelter in place and social distancing. The DDBA says that as we begin to emerge from this unparalleled time, our community's art will serve as a way to understand and memorialize our experience, and collectively this will be a testament to our resilience. And personally, as chair of the Arts Alliance Davis, I approve that message. Artists of all levels and ages are invited to participate, and the deadline for submissions has been extended to this Friday, June 19th. You can find all the details and guidelines at davisdowntown.com slash cap, C-A-P. We will take a moment for music and be back with our first interview shortly. All right, she is the Deputy Public 
Public Health Officer for Yolo County Health and Human Services, and she'll step into the role of Interim Public Health Officer at the end of this month. She's also been on staff as a pediatrician at CommuniCare Health Centers. My first guest today is Dr. Mary Ann Limbos. Dr. Limbos, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Autumn. I, I first really need to acknowledge something. Cal Matters published an article today about the unprecedented pushback county health officers are experiencing during this crisis. Everything from harassment and threats to essentially blaming you good folks for everything that displeases them. So I just want to say on, on behalf of everyone here, uh, thank you for your service and really for stepping up and managing this transition at a time of crisis. Well, I really appreciate um, that acknowledgement. It, it's been a difficult time for um, many health officers uh, in the state of California, yeah. actually, you know, across the country. So um, I, I appreciate um, I appreciate your your words and support. Sure. So you and I spoke back in March, and I think we've all lived a couple of lifetimes since then. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I really wanted to bring you back today uh, to talk about reopening and its attendant risks, and frankly. I'm really concerned about not only what I'm seeing, behaviors I'm seeing around town here in Davis, but also about the numbers of new infections and hospitalization spiraling upwards in all the counties surrounding YOLO. Yesterday, the state reported nearly 150,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases and more than 5,000 deaths. Did you envision a time when we'd see those kind of numbers? Um, honestly, no. Um, and, you know, it, it's frightening, it's concerning mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing across the country um, and in our own state. And as we, um, you know, begin this process of reopening, we are um, closely following those numbers in our region mm -hmm. and um, in our own county to um, make sure that we um, are proceeding at an appropriate pace that we don't have to reinstitute um, some of the restrictions that we've that we've had mm -hmm. um, and that our hospitals can manage the the, the new cases um, right. that we're seeing right let's clarify where we are in terms of yolo's public health order because as you know better than anyone at this point it's been just a, a moving target constantly changing so what is now permissible? I, I guess the question is, uh, where are we in the stages uh, uh, in the roadmap to recovery? So, but what's permissible and what is not at this point in time? Right. So, you know, I, I would have to look at, um, at, our, at our roadmap because it, it is, it's changing very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes w our roadmap doesn't match up um, exactly with the state. We are one of what are known as the variance counties, me meaning that we have attested to the fact that um, our cases are stable or decreasing mm -hmm. and that our hospitals um, are um, well equipped to manage any potential surge. Um, and because of this, the state has allowed these variance counties to proceed a little bit more quickly um, than the other counties in the state that um, that don't have the variances. Mm -hmm. So the, the most recent um, let's see, activities and business sectors that we opened um, on la last Friday the 12th, and there, there's really a whole host of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, just to name a few, the, the family entertainment centers, the gyms, bars and wineries, um, hotels for tourism, music, TV, um, and music production, which which isn't big in our county. Yeah. Um, public swimming pools, professional sports without uh, without audiences. Mm -hmm. So really, the the best way to to keep up to date with all these new activities and businesses that are opening up is to um, to keep checking our website yeah. because our order has been amended so that every time the state is allowing a, um, a business or activity to be opened, 
um, we will let our county know when it's opened locally by posting the guidance on our website. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's yolocounty.org, uh, just for everyone who, who could possibly not know that <laughs> at this point in time. And right on the front page, uh, you'll see the links for all the COVID-19 related information, including the roadmap to recovery, the public health orders and everything. And, and you know, Dr. Limbos, you just mentioned a lot of things reopening. And I, I guess that's the crux of my concern, because just weeks after parts of the U.S. began reopening, um, we we're seeing infections on the rise in several states, including, let's see, Arizona, Utah, Texas, and Florida. And I know in Fort Lauderdale, one week after reopening bars and restaurants, they shut them down again. So are we, do you think we're at the start of a second wave or is this still first wave of COVID infection? Um, you know, this is, probably our first wave. Uh, every state is different, and frankly, every county is different. Mm -hmm. And we've been uh, keeping a close watch on our cases because uh, we did see um, an increase in our cases uh, last, toward the end of last week. Mm -hmm. um, those of you who follow our dashboard, we update our, the number of cases um, every, um, every day. And we saw usually in YOLO, you know, we've had days when we've had zero to one cases. Usually we've been seeing about two to four. Mm -hmm. And at the end of last week, we um, saw about 20, 21 new cases over the span of a couple of days. Um, so in, in our uh, investigation of, of who these cases are and could they be perhaps linked, to the reopening of um, the new businesses um, a couple of weeks prior, what we've seen is that the majority of those new cases were linked to gatherings, mm -hmm. um, gather, uh, multi-generational family gatherings, and then gatherings um, from different households and um, even from different communities. Mm -hmm. having contact. So th th those were the majority of the, the new cases that we were seeing. Um, and so we continue to remind um, our residents um, that, uh, you know, when multiple households gather, when people from different communities gather, that really increases the risk of transmission. Yeah, yeah. Um. What kind, well, I, for, first question is, we also had Memorial Day when we know that everyone just seemed to think that was licensed to throw caution to the wind and, and gather in public places. And we also have the impact of, of people who are gathering for protest and, and marches. I will say I went to Sunday's protest and march uh, in Davis here, and the I, I would put the the rate of mask wearers at about ninety five percent. It was it was really good, and people were doing their best to observe distancing. But I can go into a store or walk downtown, and that's clearly not the case. And I'm really seeing it's clearly not the case among young people, college age students in particular. Yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, my own observation and what we've been. Seeing um, staying in the health department is our community, for the most part, has been pretty good about um, following the, the masking order, mm -hmm. or I should say the face covering orders, and um, the social distancing. I, and I really have to hand it to our businesses and our, uh, you know, our uh, our community mm -hmm. is that um, our businesses are are really trying to enforce that. Um, and I think we as a community have to be prepared to, um, to, to do the mask, to, to do the face coverings um, if we do want to be able to have more of our businesses and, and these activities mm -hmm. open. Yeah. 
So you talked a few minutes ago about the kinds of metrics that the county has to keep a close eye on, numbers of new cases, numbers of hospitalizations. What would be the tipping point for having to close back down again as we're seeing in Florida, for example? I think we, we take, um, you know, several of those metrics um, into consideration. One of the ones we follow very closely is our case positivity, mm -hmm. meaning we um, look at the number of positives um, divided by the total number of cases, or sorry, tests, mm -hmm. that we, um, that uh, we've um, that have been done in the, the county, and you know, despite the fact that we do have a grave that we had that spike of cases last week, we are also um, being able to test more. And I think what has been reassuring for us is the fact that um, despite all these new cases, uh, our case positivity rate has been um, just a little bit over three percent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in comparison to the state, the state is running at about four or five percent. And the, it, you know, for that particular metric, the tipping point is over eight percent. Okay. So our, we're we're well beyond, our, we're, we're well below that. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of our hospitalizations, you know, for for weeks, we have seen um, the number of cases hospitalized in Yolo County at about one to two. So okay. that that. Is, is all very reassuring to us. That's good news. And the, uh, I want to confirm, the county still has a testing site in West Sacramento. I, I think that ends on June 27th, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so we are working very diligently to try to replace that um, because we still want to be able to reach um, our communities that have um, uh, decreased access to testing, um, particularly our rural, rural communities. Yeah. But we also want to make sure that anybody in Yolo County who wants a test um, can get a test. So, you know, we are continu continuing to work on um, partnerships that will help us uh, replace the OptumServe site, mm -hmm. um, perhaps a mobile option, which will, you know, give us a lot of flexibility. Um, in reaching different communities. Okay. Uh, we're almost out of time. I want to I thank you. I know how incredibly busy you are right now, so thank you for making time to come and share your perspective with us. If you could share just one message or directive with the residents of Yolo County right now, what would that be? I, I would love to do that, and that is really, you know, our we have been able to safely reopen a lot of our local businesses and activities because we have been very good as a community about social distancing mm -hmm. and using face coverings. And I really want to urge our communities not to undo the hard work and sacrifice okay. that um, our residents have done so far and to be complacent. So please, please, please continue to stay home as much as possible. And when you do go out to support your, our local businesses, to wear a face covering and to practice physical distancing to the greatest extent possible. Um, you know, we've come this far together as a community. Let, let's continue to move forward. Great. Okay. Thank you again for your time and for calling in today. Thank you, Adam. All right. Take care. Bye. That was the Dr. Marianne Limbos of Yolo County Health. Bef very quickly before we get our next call, I really need to say that uh, KDRT and Davis Media Access are doing our spring fundraising right now. And folks, local media is in, in local voices and what you just heard from Dr. Limbos, for example, it's really important that we have access to that info and yet we are not getting the level of community support we usually do. Uh, it's, it's frustrating times, it's hard times, but you can go to kdrt.org and donate because we still need your help to be on the air. And we're going to take our next call. Okay, my next guest is Dr. Andy Jones, who has taught writing classes at UC Davis since 1990 and committed to outreach and encouraging cross-disciplinary thinking, Andy has hosted Dr. Andy's Poetry and Technology Hour on campus radio station KDVS since 2000. 
He's also the past chair of the Cultural Arts and Entertainment Committee of the City of Davis and the Poet Laureate Emeritus of Davis. And prior to COVID-19, he also hosted the perennially popular pub quiz, Say That Three Times Fast, at De Vere's in downtown Davis. Welcome, Dr. Andy. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you for having me on the radio show. You bet. It's nice to hear your voice back on the air. Um, so you, you've been incredibly active in the cultural life of our community, and m- many of the things you're active in just ground to a halt. So talk to us a bit about what you've been up to during these past couple of months. That's true. You mentioned the pub quiz. Yeah. And I think that the pub quiz, if it were happening today, it would be a super spreader of COVID-19 because it involves a bunch of people packed in close <laughs> to one another in an indoor restaurant uh, and with me um, shouting trivia questions at them. <laughs> so it's, it's probably best that uh, we're not gathering in that way. Another um, event that I've run for about 15 years now, and the last uh, dozen or so at the John and Phyllis Gallery, is the Poetry Night Reading Series. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has been, uh, when I was Poet Laureate, an important part of my outreach to the community. But it's also something that I did before and after. We're very lucky that John Natsoulis has such a commitment to the arts that he's opened up and staffed his big gallery at the corner of First and East Streets Mm -hmm. for us uh, twice a month on First and Third Thursdays of the month. And that would be another place where anywhere from 25 or 30 all the way up to 100 or 150, if we have Gary Snyder visiting, <laughs> uh, of people who would get together to enjoy poems uh, read by featured poets and then also by people participating in an open mic. And uh, so to answer your question, we've pivoted over to Zoom poetry reading. Nice. And as people can find out if they wanted to visit poetryindavis.com, we're still holding them on first and third Thursdays, but we get to involve poets from a great number of communities, including outside of the Sacramento Valley. So this Thursday, for instance, we have uh, a poet who will be uh, visiting us from Massachusetts, Hmm. and uh, we'll have another poet coming up from New York. And so we get to reach out to different poetry communities uh, outside of the area. So that's been uh, a lot of fun. Even if we do miss, um, you know, hugging and high-fiving yeah. each other yeah. and uh, and also the, the in-person after party. But we try to approximate some of these cultural <laughs> events the best that we can. Yeah, there are a few silver linings to, to the virtual life, so to speak. And, you, you know, you just mentioned one of them being able to involve a, a, a wider circle of, of poets. Um, I want to talk about KDVS for just a moment. It was, you know, we were kind of shocked and saddened to learn that KDVS had at least temporarily gone off the air in March. And it was a factor of not having automation and the students not being able to access KDVS. Um, But as such a long running college station and, and my goodness, your show has run for the last 20 years on KDVS. Um, what's the status these days? I, I hear some evergreen programming when I tune in, but I'm not sure what the status moving forward is. That's right. They, um, they have a, a skeleton crew working sometimes in the station, but often remotely to present um, best of programming, evergreen programming, including my radio show on Wednesdays at 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a, an archive that um, continually records whatever we broadcast at KDBS, and that lasts for um, the 12 months preceding any particular date. And as a result, there's lots of content that our programming staff has been able to grab to uh, keep um, uh, those people who are fans of KDBS with plenty to listen to. But it is a different experience when you don't have uh, the regular stream of DJs and public affairs hosts and, and news broadcasters uh, heading down there, a yep. real mix of community and students, to uh, head into Studio B and to uh, broadcast regularly, yep. as I've been doing yep. for a couple of decades now. That's very relatable here for us, too. Yeah. So we have just a few minutes left, so I'm, I'm hoping you brought a poem for us today. I sure did. Great. I've been, um, one thing that I've discovered in this last, uh, 
really week and a half is a genealogy of all topics. Hmm. We choose all sorts of ways to procrastinate when um, we are stuck at home perpetually. And I've uh, been in conversations with uh, my mom and cousins and others about uh, people from previous generations of the family. So I thought I would uh, share just a, a quick poem that um, uh, touches on that. Great. It's called uh, Shillelagh. One can almost call it munificence, the great grandmother's abundant propitiousness. Stories remain of the oversized hand's fingers on a shoulder or taking a pulse or mixing merengue. She was a force. Nothing and no one were ever stolen from her household. The mutilations were only mental, the many children thought to themselves as they grew older, daring not to escape. No one else in the village had had so many children. Two generations later, the grandchildren had trouble not falling in love with one another, <laughs> all of them with plump fingers, powerful hands that gripped and struck with the weight of a thousand pies, a thousand shillelagh. Hmm. Nice. Thank you. And you got to love a poet who run, rhymes munificence with propitiousness. <laughs> That's not one that comes up uh, every day. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for making a few minutes to call in. We are out of time. Um, thank you, Dr. Andy Jones. You take care. Absolutely. It's, it's my pleasure. Best Good to, to you and your, your You too. Best to you and your family. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> From one doctor to another and a, a lot of terrain in between. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. I, I, I had to cut my message a little short earlier, but thank you, if you can, for stepping up to support this community station during this time. Again, you can donate at kdrt.org. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and this has been the COVID-19 Community Report.